Hi everyone, uh, my name is Julianne Schroeder and I'm an assistant professor at the Haas School of Business. And today I get to share some of my research with you. Um, this talk is entitled, The Sound of Intellect, uh, When the Mouth Can Be Mightier Than the Pen. So uh, this is the research question that keeps me up at night. Uh, it's a philosophical problem called the other minds problem. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with this philosophical question, uh, essentially it boils down to the fact that we cannot directly access the minds of those around us. So that is to say that we can never know exactly what other people are thinking or feeling. And so we have to somehow guess that or infer that. Uh, and so these, these social inferences are really critical to all of the judgments and the decisions that we make in life. Uh, and so that's what I study is how we can come to understand what other people are thinking and feeling without having direct access into, into their minds. Uh, and so one of the questions I've been exploring in my research is how do we convey what is on our minds, that is our mental capacities, our thoughtfulness and our emotionality to others. And uh, one of the primary methods that we use to convey what's on our minds to others is through language. And a lot of prior research has looked at how language is used in order to convey um, social information. Now, what prior research hasn't looked at very carefully, at least, is that there are these two different methods that you can use to, to convey um, what's on your minds to others. One is that you can talk to them. So the, just the way I'm talking to you right now, you can listen to what I'm saying through the sound of my voice. But the other method, of course, is that you could convey the same words through text, through a text-based medium. So you could write, for example. And importantly, uh, and so the research question I'm addressing is whether people form different inferences about another person's mental capacities if they hear what they have to say compared to if they read the exact same words in writing. So what does it do to have nonverbal information in the person's voice, for example, or in being able to see them, I'll look at that as well, compared to, to reading what they have to say. Okay, and so it's important to note that these two methods of communication have these different, a different set of information that they can convey, and in particular, voice has what we call paralinguistic cues. Okay, so these are um, cues beyond the semantic content, beyond the words I'm, I'm saying. What you can get is you can get um, information in the tone of my voice, so the pitch. You're getting information from uh, the volume, how loudly or softly I'm speaking. You're getting information from the rate of speech. So you're, you're getting a lot of information from audio that you don't get from text. Um, text has another sort of set of information, like you can imagine using punctuation differently in text than in speech. So, so these two methods convey very different sorts of information. And the question is, does it convey information about person, a person's mental capacities? Okay, so what we know from prior research in psychology and organizational behavior and, and sociology is that um, being able to hear someone speak does actually uh, uh, convey greater information about mental content. That is what the person is thinking. Okay, so um, let me give you a few examples. So in one line of research, uh, people, um, for instance, Try, uh, c communicators express something like sarcasm or humor, a complex intention, essentially, to a set of observers. And then the observers get to either hear what that person said, or they watch the video of what the person said, or they read what the person said, that, so they read the transcript. And uh, what that research finds is that it's really critical to be able to hear the person. It doesn't matter so much if you see them or not, but hearing them uh, is what really improves observers' accuracy and being able to guess that the person was trying to be sarcastic or trying to be humorous. All right, so um, that's sort of intuitively uh, sensible that there's a certain tone of voice that's associated with sarcasm, for example. There's another line of work that looks at this in, in even greater depth and shows that communicators, as they're expressing their thoughts and feelings, they, um, and they're reporting what it is that they think and feel, um, another set of observers that they can accurately assess that, but only when they hear the voice. When they get the, the information through text, they're not accurate anymore, or at least they're not as accurate. Um, and so why is that? Well, um, you know, separate set of research implicates paralinguistic cues and voice. It's not really clear whether it's tone of voice or the rate of speech, but something about that extra information, the nonverbal information in voice that's, that's conveying this, this insight into the person's mind. 
And so what I'm asking is something that's sort of fundamentally different from that prior research. It's really, does hearing someone speak actually make them seem more mentally capable? So mean level assessments of their mental capacities than reading what they have to say. And uh, essentially what I'm predicting in, in this line of work is that the paralinguistic cues in a person's voice, they don't just give you insight into what the person is thinking. They actually give you these online reminders, these cues that the person is having these spontaneous thoughts and feelings. So as you listen to my voice, you're getting this information like, hey, she is having these thoughts and these feelings. And just those subtle cues are biasing you to believe that I'm a more thoughtful person overall than if you were to read the same words in text. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to share a series of experiments I ran testing this idea, and they're in the context of hiring decisions. And this is a context where we would expect um, that the, the communication medium could really matter because it's a domain in which, you know, assuming that employers are looking for smart, intelligent, thoughtful employees, uh, they're going to be focused on, on that particular type of evaluation. Uh, and so this is a domain where we think that communication medium could affect evaluations in a meaningful way. Okay, and what's more is that um, most uh, job candidates, uh, particularly MBA students, have their uh, practiced and ready elevator pitch. Okay, so you can find thousands and thousands of books and articles online about how to perfect your, your elevator pitch. And this is, you know, a two minute spiel to a potential employer about why they should hire you. Uh, and so I ran a series of experiments and let me tell you how these experiments work. Uh, what I did is I collected a set of job candidates and these are full time MBA students who are really looking for jobs at the time, so real candidates. Uh, 18 of them, and I brought them into the laboratory in exchange for uh, $5 Starbucks gift cards, and I told them to just give their elevator pitch on videotape. Okay, so explain, we asked them to pick their top employer and then make their pitch about why they should be hired by that employer, and then we videotaped those pitches, and then we also asked them to write a little bit about why they should be hired. So the writing ends up being an excerpt. It looks like an excerpt from a cover letter, essentially. And they had as much time as they wanted to make those pitches, to be compelling as they wanted. Um, and uh, statistically, the number of words that they wrote and spoke were actually the same uh, in both of those different stimulus. And then we have a set, and so those are the stimuli for a set of experiments uh, in which we have a set of evaluators who will uh, come into the lab or will get them in the field sometimes. And the evaluators are tasked with either watching uh, what the candidates uh, said or listening to the candidate or reading what the candidate wrote. And then they have to, they only do this for one candidate and then they have to make an evaluation of the candidate. Okay, and they make three different types of evaluations. This is on a survey. So first they tell us their overall impression of the candidate's intellect. So it's three questions. How competent was the candidate? How thoughtful was the candidate? And how intelligent do they seem? Uh, then they tell us their overall impression of the candidate and they, they specifically said how much they liked the candidate, how positive their impression was and how negative their impression was. Uh, and then they said, would they hire the candidate? Okay. Uh, and so they just re re report a number on a zero to 10 scale for each of these items. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do in a set of experiments is I, I'm going to manipulate, uh, randomly assign evaluators to one of these different communication media to observe uh, a, candidate, a job candidate uh, and then see how their impressions of the candidate changes. Okay, and so all the analyses I present are hierarchical, hierarchical analyses. Okay, so let me get to one of the experiments. Okay, so in this experiment, we actually had uh, almost 200 people who are at a museum for science and tech who are willing to participate in an experiment. Uh, so we, we recruit them to participate in an experiment and then we enroll them in this. And we assign them to one of three conditions. So either they hear the candidate's um, voice, so they hear the candidate's elevator pitch, essentially, or they read a transcript of the same pitch. And so we just took the exact same words from the speech and we transcribed it. Um, or they watched a video and listened to the audio as well. And the reason why we had this third experimental condition was to see 
if it could just be something about having more information about someone makes you think of them as being more intellectually capable. So maybe it's just the case that having more information, like knowing what the person looks like, hearing their voice, other things, just makes you um, individuate them more and think they're more intellectually capable. If that's the case, then we should see that people have a higher impression of job candidates when they watch them in addition to hearing them compared to just hearing them. But if that's not the case, if it's something that's unique to hearing uh, the voice, and it's really the voice that, that makes the person seem smart, uh, then we should only see an effect of the audio condition, and we should see no effect of the video condition in addition. Okay? Uh, and so what I'm showing you now is a graph, and on the y-axis is the, all the evaluators, uh, their, their impressions of the job candidate on the 0 to 10 scale. And so first we'll just look at intellect. Their, their impressions of the candidate's intellect. And what you see is that there really were no differences between watching the video of the candidate compared to hearing the candidate overall in terms of um, their impressions of the candidate's intellect. Okay, but critically, when they read the transcript, uh, these evaluators think that the candidates seem much less intelligent. Okay, and they have a lower impression overall of the candidates and they're less interested in hiring that particular candidate. Okay, so the words are exactly the same, but reading the transcripts make the candidate seem less mentally capable, essentially. Okay, um, so, so that's an interesting finding, but it's, it's potentially, it has some potential problems because uh, the transcript is kind of a weird condition, right? Because first of all, the job candidates were not intending for their messages to be consumed in transcript form. And then also, it's kind of weird for anyone to be reading a transcript of what someone has to say. So maybe this is just sort of a, a, a finding about transcripts, that, they're, that they make people seem less intelligent. And so maybe that's what's going on there. And so what we really want to do, actually, is evaluate whether uh, observers would believe that the candidates uh, seem less intelligent, even when they read the candidate's own written statements. Okay, so that's another form of medium that's only text, but that's a, a form of medium where the, the candidates are intending to be read through the text. Uh, and so maybe it's the case that candidates are actually able to seem uh, smarter again uh, through their own writing, right? Maybe they're sort of aware of this and they use tools and writing to compensate. And so maybe there would be no differences between hearing a candidate and reading what they have to say in their own writing. So we ran another experiment, a totally new set of evaluators, another, another set of adults from the museum. Uh, and, these, uh, and we put them into one of three experimental conditions. So either they hear the candidate's um, spoken elevator pitch, or they read the transcribed pitch. So that was just to keep the content exactly the same. Or they read what the candidate wrote. OK, so this is the candidate's cover letter, essentially, that, the excerpt from the cover letter. And so they're evaluating them again, and so I'm showing you the same graph. And what you see, uh, first of all, what we found is that we replicated what we got in the prior experiment. So if you heard what the candidate had to say, you thought they were smarter, uh, that people had a, more, a higher impression of them, and they're more interested in hiring them compared to reading the transcript of the same words. But then what happens when they read the writing? And what you see in the graph is that when evaluators read the written statements, they evaluate the candidates the same way that they would as they read the transcripts. Okay, so really they still uh, think that the candidates seem less intelligent when they're reading their own writing compared to when they heard those candidates. Uh, now, one possible explanation for this is that maybe we just happen to pick a set of job candidates who happen to be more articulate speakers uh, than, than writers. Okay, so maybe these are not such a great set of writers for some reason. And so maybe just the written statements were just less compelling than the spoken statements, you know, because the actual content is a little bit different in those two, uh, those two forms of medium. And so we wondered, you know, could we take those candidates' written statements and add voice to the writing to make the candidate seem more intelligent again? Okay, so if it's something about voice, we could just artificially add voice. And when I say add voice, what I mean is that we'll bring in a new set of people who will speak those written statements aloud. And so we actually brought a bunch of actors into the lab. We had two male and two female actors. And we gave them some instructions about how to read the candidates' written statements. 
And specifically, we gave them these instructions. We said, pretend that you're the job candidate, imbue your words with the thoughts and the emotions and the substance that you think the writer felt, and um, speak naturally. And we, the reason we gave them those instructions was just to try to capture what we think the natural cues are in a person's voice that may convey their thoughts and feelings. So the actors try to speak these written statements as naturally as they can, and then we have a new experiment in which we have a new set of evaluators who are going to either hear the actor's voices, oh sorry, they're going to hear the actor's voices, or they're going to read the candidate's written statements. So just two experimental conditions. And um, it turns out that they evaluated all the actors' voices uh, quite similarly, so there are no distinction in how they evaluate the male voices versus, no meaningful distinction in terms of how they evaluate the male voices versus the female voices. But what you see in the results, which I'll just put up the graph right now, is that the um, evaluators who heard the actors' voices actually believed that those job candidates were more intelligent they didn't have any um, difference in opinions about their overall impressions. They didn't think they were more likable, um, but they were more interested in hiring them. So when they heard those voices compared to when they read the candidates' written statements. Okay, so, uh, so what this suggests is that by adding these other people's voices to the statements, we were again able to make those candidates seem more intellectually capable, more mentally capable to a set of evaluators. Okay, so then there's one final experiment that I would uh, love to share with you. And so uh, in this experiment, we uh, collected a set of professional recruiters. So in all of our prior experiments, um, we have been using these adults from a museum who just happened to volunteer to be in the study. And so one problem with that is that maybe you know, these are naive um, participants. They're just uh, a, random adult, a random set of adults across all different age groups. Um, they have no experience necessarily evaluating job candidates. And so maybe it's the case that recruiters who have a lot of experience evaluating, in particular, this type of job, these set of job candidates, they evaluate these, these MBA students who are in my sample, um, maybe they would be less likely to show this, this bias. Uh, and maybe you know, they would pay a lot more attention to the actual content, the actual words that the person is expressing. And so we would see no difference between maybe audio and text among these recruiters. That could be possible. So we wanted to test that question, and to do that, we um, got a set of professional recruiters. Um, these were recruiters from companies like Pricewaterhouse and Deloitte and Goldman Sachs and Microsoft. And uh, we randomly picked uh, just a small subset of the uh, job candidate pitches that we had used in our prior experiments. And we had the recruiters either listen to the pitch or read the transcript in this case. And then they gave us those same evaluations. So they weren't making real hiring decisions, but they did tell us, they evaluated the candidate, they told us how intelligent they thought the candidate seemed, how likable, and whether or not they would be interested in hiring this person. And so what you see, and I just put the graph up, is that uh, even these recruiters, if anything, the effects look a little bit bigger, even these recruiters really believed that the candidates seemed smarter and they had, were more likable, had a higher impression of them, and they were more interested in hiring them if they could hear the candidates compared to if they read the transcripts. Okay, and they know that those are the transcripts. So if anything, you know, the recruiters are showing the effects just as much as any of our naive evaluators in any of our studies. Okay, so um, another set of questions uh, that come from this is, you know, are the communicators themselves, like the job candidates in these studies, uh, do they anticipate this? Like, do they have some awareness that, hey, maybe uh, the, you know, any set of evaluators or recruiters might evaluate my um, spoken pitch more positively than they would evaluate my written pitch? Okay, so we actually went back to the job candidates themselves that were in these studies, these very studies, and we asked them. So we asked them uh, to make two predictions. We said, how positively do you think an employer would evaluate your written pitch, and how positively would they evaluate your spoken pitch? And then we also asked, how interested do you think an employer would be to hire you after reading your um, written pitch or listening to your spoken pitch? 
Okay, and so they, they um, just circled a number on a scale to answer these questions, and, uh, and they, the number was between zero and six. And here's what we find. Essentially, what we find is that the, the candidates don't seem to anticipate that there will be much of a difference in evaluations between these two conditions. So they think that they'll be evaluated about as positively whether they're speaking or they're writing, and they think that the, an employer would be just as interested in hiring them whether they're speaking or writing. So statistically, there are no differences between these conditions. Okay, but it is a pretty small sample, and so we wanted to collect a larger sample of, uh, of participants to, to really see if people anticipate this. And so we asked, a, we ran a couple other studies. So in one study, we asked another set of over 100 full-time MBA students. We asked them, how would you prefer to convince a top employer to hire you? Okay, and so, and then we kind of constrain the options that we said. Imagine you have two options. You can send a spoken pitch about why you should be hired to your employer and assume that the employer actually listens to the whole thing. Okay, or you can send a written pitch about why you should be hired to that employer and again assume that the employer reads the whole thing. So which do you think, which would you prefer to use to convince a, an employer to hire you? And here's what we find. Uh, so essentially, there's, again, statistically no difference between people's preferences. Uh, directionally, it looks like they have a slightly higher preference to send that spoken pitch than the written pitch. But uh, it doesn't seem like they really fully comprehend how differently they'll actually be evaluated in these conditions. And then finally, in a bunch of other experiments, we've asked, um, these are not MBA students, these are just online participants. We've asked them generally about what method they would prefer to use to convey their intellect. And so we've asked surveys where we ask them, um, if you want to be perceived as the most intelligent, how would you prefer to express your thoughts to someone else? Would you prefer to speak or would you prefer to write? And people overwhelmingly choose writing. Okay, so presumably, um, maybe they're thinking about, for example, um, editing their writing or having other people look at their writing, and so they have more time to kind of perfect that writing and uh, make it seem as intelligent as, as they possibly can make it. But, um, you know, what I suggest is that what people fail to realize is that they can also edit their speech. They can also work on pitches, work on answers to questions that they've really carefully edited and um, practiced. And, uh, and so, you know, if you assume that people are sort of practicing as much in speech as they are in writing, then maybe people have sort of a mistaken uh, prediction about this, that actually maybe the, the spoken pitch would be a little bit more compelling than the written pitch. Uh, okay, so uh, those are all the experiments I have to share with you today. So kind of to conclude, what I hope I've demonstrated to you, um, I've provided you some evidence that suggests that being able to hear someone speak compared to reading the same words and text, it doesn't just convey the content of their thoughts, which other works suggest that it does, but moreover, my research suggests that it actually can reveal their capacity for thinking. So it makes them seem more intellectually capable. And, uh, and so, you know, one interesting implication of this is that maybe people need to really be careful, particularly in contexts where they're trying to make a good first impression, uh, that they really want to create an opportunity for their voice to be, to, to be heard. And um, another sort of interesting implication to think about from this research is the, the sort of advent of communication in the workplace and particularly how technology has been changing the ways that we communicate with others. And so a lot of technology is making our communication more text-based. Um, so we can now sort of G-chat with the person in the office right next to us without even ever having to get up and go over to their office to see them. Uh, but it does seem like um, at least there's a set of, of new businesses, and particularly you see this in apps, that are coming out that might recognize that even though texting is kind of convenient and easy and it also keeps sort of a record of what you have to say, that there are certain things that get lost in text that might 
be critical, specifically for being able to accurately assess another person's um, thoughts and feelings and being able to convey thoughts and feelings to people. And so um, there's a set of apps I just kind of want to pull out. These are the first ones that sort of came to mind. Core, Taco, and then all the latest versions of the iPhone have this as well, where you can now send voice messages. Um, you can have voice-based conversations where um, what you say is, is being recorded, so you can sort of keep track of, of uh, keep, keep records of everything that's being said. And so I think um, some of these uh, new technologies are, are changing the workplace in some really interesting psychological ways that are allowing us to, to better understand other people's thoughts and feelings. And so it's sort of interesting to think about how that's changing in the workplace. Uh, okay, so that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, it doesn't look like there are any questions right now. Um, okay, so uh, I, I think that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for your time.